Thank you, Susanna. Uh, as, she, as Susanna has mentioned, this is the first time I'm coming to, uh, to this particular forum. And I was wondering why I was invited. And I was here yesterday with such a lot of buzz and excitement. And then I figured why she invited a UN representative to temper it down, um, to get the adrenaline kind of right down to a lowest level. Uh, because that's what we are famous for. I, and I hope I won't disappoint you. Uh, so I started off with this. Uh, and it was an interesting thing with a generational gap. And I looked at this and I sort of said, this is something that uh, uh, my, uh, my colleague at the institute had put it up. And the first thing now, which is a very favorite term that I use is WTF. Uh, it was introduced to, to me by my youngest. I had written to her something, and she, she wrote back WTF. I was so excited. She said, WTF? The only WTF I knew was the World Taekwondo Federation, <laughs> which I was a member of for many years. I said, my daughter finally got it. And then, I, then she told me what it stood for. It's like, OK, <laughs> it's a generational gap. So this is something to think about. I want to start off with some data. It's kind of a depressing data. As I said, she, uh, Susanna gave me the, uh, the marching orders to bring it down. And, and if you look at the Indian data, it's kind of frightening. I was a little bit shocked with that. Where 25% of you know, children between the ages of 13 and 15, we're not talking about the teens. Uh, well, these are the teens, but post-21, 13 to 15, um, have some form of mental uh, problems. And these are the only reported ones. This is a WHO 2015 report. You can imagine what the real numbers are. It's going to be much more significant. And then we have on the global scale 800,000 people between the ages of 15 and 20 are dying by suicide. Something that Kelly Donald told, we don't say committing suicide, dying by suicide every year. And one of the main drivers that we found was education. Education is one of these major drivers. Recently in India, there was, uh, the board exams were released. This is at the age of, I believe, 15 years old. And on that one day, 15 suicides because they did not pass the exams. And this is at the age of 15, God, exams. Uh, but that's the pressure that they are on. And then couple that with the increasing unemployment, job insecurity, we don't know what those jobs are, the education system's not catering, it is in a mess. And that's what it comes back to, the education system is, how many would say what that cryptic word is? So there goes the WTF, we have that. So the education system is, and you know, Personally, I've experienced that. And I thought that things would have changed over time. I have three children, and I had my youngest, my oldest, who, because we were moving from country to country, um, and in one particular country, I'm not going to name countries, uh, you know, he was at the age of about four or five when he just entered school, and basically the teacher said he was dumb. He's going to be slow. You accept the fact he's dumb. He couldn't read, he was having problems writing. And, and as of, you know, parents, we were kind of shocked because the system was set up in a way it was very regimented, very one size fits all. So luckily we moved and then he was diagnosed with acute dyslexia. It was the only one, it was a neurobiological problem. And Luckily for us, we were able to have the resources to send him to a specialized school in upstate New York. And there is when I became what I call a game anthropologist. I kind of looked at him because he was a gamer. He really melded into the gaming community. Uh, he played all the so-called wrong games. But what I could see is that he transformed. He improved. He, became, he had his own identity. And he started excelling in 
in the school. The school was pretty relaxed. They allowed them to play games. The first thing that he was given when he went to the school was a laptop and said, this is it. This is your life. Protect it. And the digital, he, he was completely digital. All his classes were in with a digital field. And he went on to graduate in chemistry. A guy who was called slow, dumb, and he will never finish high school, went on to finish a degree in chemistry. Now, unfortunately, he's gone into weed farming. <laughs> uh, we are Canadians, so we live in Canada, and now it's been. So he said, I'm going to go into wheat farming. And he's doing really well. <laughs> in more ways than one. Uh, but that's where the future is. And when I look back, I think how my two daughters, who, under the normal cliche of normal, actually were robbed of that rich education environment that he had an opportunity to. And that's one of the reasons that I thought that this is the way that we need to go to. This is the future. And then the other experience that I had was that I teach economics. I'm a visiting professor at the University of Tokyo. I teach sustainability economics. And I was one day kind of writing all the equations. And I was like, I nearly fell asleep myself. It was so boring. And I turned around. Everybody was like half asleep. I said, we've got to find some way of making this more exciting. And so we teamed up with a group in Bangalore, and we developed a game called Kanthos World on how to actually teach a very complex economics concept of what we call inclusive wealth through a game. And for the first time, we saw economic students actually laughing and having a good time. I wasn't sure that was a good thing or not, because you know, we were trained to be well, we call the dismissal science. Uh, but it, it was a way of teaching, and kids enjoyed it. So that's, that's the kind of motivation that we took at the Institute. And we've been very strong on games right from the time that I took on the directorship in 2014. So what do we need in education based on, this, on, on these uh, experiences? And if you look at it, multinodal to fit different styles, this is something that I'm not, I think I'm preaching to the choir here. We have had over the last day or two on how the whole notion of multinodal is so important, just not tax. One of the things that I uh, do very frequently is uh, at, at my age, having a good night's sleep is so difficult. Um, and most people take sleeping you know, chemicals to go to sleep. I take my son's constitutional Canadian history <laughs> textbook as a fantastic sleeping <laughs> supplementary. Within five minutes, I'm gone. And I get a good, good night's sleep. It's so boring. And they find it boring. Whereas kids learn differently. What, we, what we, I think I want to emphasize is that we should not completely say every kid should have gaming. I think we should have and provide a whole suite of different uh, forums, tools, and they choose what they want to. Otherwise, we are falling into the same trap where we force everybody to do one particular option. Some kids will do really well in gaming. Some might not. We should provide that opportunities as well. So the 20%, that's what I think, who do really well with our present system should be allowed to have that as well. Otherwise, you're robbing them of their uh, freedom. Dynamic and changing with feedback, textbooks. When I used to teach in economics, especially in environmental economics, there were so many mistakes in the textbooks. But we'll have to wait five years or six years before the next revision comes here. With the digital, you're there. Changing is dynamic. And you get feedback, you can instantly change that. It offers that opportunity. Interactive and immersive. We want kids to interact. We want to get them to be immersive into the issue, especially relevant. I remember doing my first degree. Uh, I went in for physics, and then I switched to electronics. And I think the year I graduated, I came home 
on a holiday and, my, and the TV was not working. My mom says, go fix the TV. I was looking at the TV. And it's like, why do you ask me to fix the TV? I said, I, I just spent four years educating you with electronics. You should be able to fix a TV. <laughs> it's like, no, that's all theory. I don't know how to fix a TV. Uh, relevance is really important. And I think when you have relevance connected to a curriculum, the uptake is so much faster. And I think we have so many examples of rele relevance starting even from grade one to grade 12 and beyond that we need to drastically change the way we teach and the, the way we teach maths. One of the dreams that I have is that when, you, uh, uh, when a kid comes in grade one, and this is a challenge to some of the big companies uh, and even the designers and stuff, is if a kid comes in grade one, you're given a game uh, with a game, and sort of say, play the game. And if you finish the game, you finish maths. And it's, and it's maths for grade one, two, three, to 10. And you could have finished grade 12 by the time you're actually in theoretically grade eight. Or you might take a bit longer. That's OK. But the game allows you to constantly play fail, come back, try again. And one of the things that I really hated is exams, the way that we exa our assessments are today. We used to have, a, what we used to call it, we didn't call it exams, we say spotting. So what, we, what do we do? We spend most of the time not learning about the damn issue, pardon my language, but about spotting which questions are going to come out in the exams, All right? Well, I, I came with the old British system uh, where you get examined at uh, grade when you're about 16. All that years of work, so you can't cover all that. So you sort of say, you spot the exams, uh, spot the questions. You, sp you look at the last three years, four years, you see a pattern. Sometimes it's a hit, sometimes it's a miss. But you're not learning. It's a whole different game by itself. Actually, we should develop a game called spotting on exams as well. And that's what I talk about, the endogenous and continuous assessment. Because when you go into an exam, it, it, sometimes it just puts you in, out of the zone. Sometimes you get into the zone, then it's fine. But most of the time, that you're so stressed. By the time you get into an exam, it's, you're already defeated. Why do we want to do that? And then I used to love the, the, the fact that some teachers sort of say, this is a trick question. Why on earth are you trying to trick this kid? You just want to get the get to see whether the, he has learned the prior subject. I used to do that as well. I used to love doing trick questions with the, with the students when I was teaching economics. I kind of question why I ever did that now. And rewarding, where learning becomes fun. I forgot to put the word fun, actually. That's important. Most teachers might think that's oxymoronic. How can learning be fun? It should be hard. You know, it should be difficult. Why? why? It should be fun. So what games are already providing, many of those relate to what I've just mentioned. So I'm making a strong case that games are. I don't need to tell you that. I think you're all convinced about it. What I should have in this, in this particular group are some of the UN policymakers who oversee education. How many of you have heard of SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals? Right, this is quite an informed group. Um, I've gone to some UN organizations and they hardly see any hands. No, I'm just joking. Uh, but SDG 4 is on education. But what's happening there, and which is quite frightful, it's about supporting the system that we already have, which means we're supporting a system which is broken. We're going to put, put millions of dollars, millions of dollars on teacher training, millions of dollars on curriculum, on a system that is broken. And it will never change. A common joke we, uh, that we say is that if you took a teacher in fact, the education sector is the only sector where if you took a teacher for 300 years ago and 
climb the teacher right now, they'll feel very comfortable because things haven't really changed. So it's time to disrupt. And that's what I'm throwing a challenge to this particular group on really being destructive. Disruptive, not destructive. Disruptive. Positive disruption. So games in education, we already have made that strong argument that games provide those demand needs from the education sector. I want to emphasize that it, these three things are important. And if we don't focus on these three things, we might lose a golden opportunity that we have here on mainstreaming games as a main teaching tool and approach. Pedagogy has to be strong. Learning has to be there, which means that within the game, there has to be a pre and post assessments to sort of see if this is working. The reason we put this up is that there's been a huge influx of all kinds of le digital learning tools, games included, which when we really evaluated were nothing more than just fancy gizmos. There wasn't really any significant change in pedagogy. And that's why when we talk about games and digital learning, we don't think about it as a transmissive pedagogy. It's a transformative pedagogy. That's what we tend to push for. And how do you evaluate that? That's important. And then we have the assessments to be built into that game. Not to have a game, and then you sit, go and sit for a three-hour exam in the traditional system. Have that built into it. Am I having a support group there? Yes. Right. This is what I want to really focus on. The institute, which is called the Mahatma Gandhi Institute, on Education for Peace and Sustainable Development, we were given the mandate that you need to look at SDG 4.7. How many of you have heard of SDG 4.7? All right, much lower. You know what I call 4.7 as the residual. If you go into an international negotiations where governments are negotiating and then, and then they have this, all these things that they don't know what to do with, and they say, okay, let's put it all into one particular goal. And if you read 4.7, it's, it's a mouthful. You, you've got education for peace, education for human rights, education for sustainable development, and the, it just keeps on going. But if you look at the essence, that's the strongest element that really actually will ensure all the other SDGs are achieved. So what we decided, we are a maverick in, the, in UNESCO. We are called a problem child in UNESCO. We said, we're going to take 4.7, but we're going to take four as well. We're going to whole, disrupt the whole education system. And one of the ways that we talked about 4.7 is we had a strong push to talk about Gandhi's values. And we said, no point, right? Because we all know about what Gandhi stood for. So what we wanted to do is, how do we train people's brains and minds to be like a Gandhi? or at least aspire to be like a Gandhi. And so we went into the neurosciences, great work that has been coming out over the last 20 years, so it's very new as well, and the whole notion of social-emotional learning. A lot of that has been also discussed in this, in this particular forum, and I'm really happy to hear, hear the SEL is coming really mainstream. So, Games is good, we disrupt the education system, we move into games, but if we just still focus on building intellectual intelligence or rational intelligence, it's not enough. We need to build the emotional intelligence as well. And I make a strong case that the SEL should be embedded within the games rather than have a separate game on SEL. SEL should be embedded in all the games, if one is possible. So if you have a game on mathematics, have social emotional learning embedded into it. If you have a game on strategic thinking, 
have SEL built into it. It's tough. But games allow it because if you take a story narrative approach, SEL naturally evolves. If you want to teach mathematics, gives you an example. Take climate change or migration. You can teach mathematics. Climate, I actually like climate change because you can go right up to differential calculus, teaching because climate change, you need to understand differential calculus at its extreme complexity. But at the very simple, it's just simple addition, subtraction. But with climate change, you can actually invoke emotional reactions. And then you can bring in the social emotional elements. We talk social emotional in terms of self-regulation, emotional regulation, empathy, Compassion. These are the four that we think about. So this is what we need a little bit more in the games. The present generation of games, this is interesting. We have, so there is a lot of data we say have stimulated neuroplasticity in attention regulation and sensory motor coordination, have feel good chemicals. Jay McDonald has a great paper on that and a TED talk on that, dopamine and serotonin, and then have increased cognitive capabilities functional connectivity. The interesting thing is that as many papers which support this, there are equally a number of papers that come and say the opposite. So the jury is still out in the science, and we should be aware of that. So be careful and cognizant that the jury is still out. We need more work. But I think we have strong grounds to move forward and sort of say that games can have an impact on learning, positive impact. But what we need to be concerned about is the type of games, looking at the three that we had included earlier, pedagogy, learning, and assessments. So what we need from games right now is the creation of new neural networks, neuroplasticity, that will provide strong links across the thinking brain, the neocortex, the prefrontal cortex, and the emotional brain, which is the limbic and the famous amygdala. I love this term. How many of you have heard of the word, the amygdala hijack? It's a great concept, and it happens on a daily basis. And the idea here is how do we can develop games that will train the brain to minimize that hijack? That's the challenge. And if you develop games with this kind of learning outcomes, I think the opportunity of really making inroads into education and beyond education are huge. We call it the Gandhi Neural Network. We call it firing Gandhi neurons, is the term that we use. Drawing from the neuroscientist from UC San Diego, Rama, Ramachandran, who coined the word of empathy neurons, Gandhi neurons, mirror neurons. So there are neurons available. It's a matter of designing it in such a way that you fire those neurons. And the highest return on, the, on investment comes at the, in the younger generation. Neuroplasticity is at its peak at about 18, 20, if I'm not mistaken. People like me take a lot longer. We have a low ROI. So forget about the older generation. I want to show you a little bit about a uh, activity that we did.
So this is an activity that we have started where we take existing games, where we see potential, we build a curriculum on top of that, we work with the original design team as well. Um, and then what you saw at the latter end was where we bring kids uh, from across uh, socioeconomic uh, profiles. They sit together and actually develop their own curriculums al along the, that game. It's interesting to see many of their curriculums are much stronger than the ones that are designed by even what we started off with, because they get involved into that. So it's, it's great to sort of see the co-creation. So we call it creatons, where you see co-creation, and sometimes we have tried co-creation with the teacher and the students on their own courses. So the idea is they co-create their curriculums, and by the time they finish co-creating the curriculums, they have finished studying the subject. A word of caution. So gaming disorder listed as the mental health condition for the first time by the World Health Organization. So we have to be cognizant of this. They got a big lash back on that, not from the gaming community, but by the medical community to sort of say that you don't have enough data to, do, to put this up on that list. It is not, it's not fixed. I think there's going to be a negotiations again in Geneva. And I think it's important for this community plus other gaming communities to make a strong argument that this is not automatic and it should not be considered as, as a mental health condition. So our interventions, I want to talk a little bit about, it's interesting, I only have three minutes and 12 seconds. I was sitting at the back listening to the previous speaker and say, how long is it going on? And when you are here, it just goes by in a whiz. It's like, but so I'll try to get this done. The WISAC Declaration Guidelines for Digital Learning, we, so what we do is we are UNESCO. So it's in our DNA that we always have this high-level policy forum. We bring in ministers or senior-level uh, bureaucrats from the ministries. They represent those countries officially. They just don't come on their own capacity, but they actually are. So we had about 10 countries. It was a start. Um, where they were very strongly felt that we should have a set of universal principles. It's not supposed to be a, top of, a kind of a top-down regulatory framework, but sort of universal principles and guidelines across the broad area of digital learning, but with a speciality on games. So the guidelines for digital learning, primarily the purpose is to provide developers, artists, teachers, educators, parents, and sets a set of universally accepted principles to be followed when developing digital content for learning, where parents can also use this as a guide to sort of say, is this appropriate? This has gone through those guidelines, whether it's been checked uh, and is useful for developers. And this was driven actually by the community. We were very surprised. Some of the biggest companies like Ubisoft, uh, Hatch, Unity, Samsung, Microsoft were all involved in this process and they were pushing for these guidelines. I thought there would be a pushback, but actually they were saying this would be welcome uh, in the process. So we, we gathered the, the different stakeholders. We've got a lot of, uh, quite a few academics. And what we started first off is doing a review of digital learning. Gaming was one component and one of you, I won't name uh, the person, but one of you from here is part of that particular. Uh, will I embarrass you if I say your name out or point you out? All right. So Matthew Faber is part of that group, um, was doing on the digital, uh, on the gaming part. And this is a kind of 
framework that they are, uh, they are going to use in terms of providing some form of a discussion on the guidelines. So if you can sort of say equitable, accessibility, uh, megacognition, within me me metacognition you have social cognition which brings in the social emotional learning dimensions, differential learning according to one interests and needs. So these are all the different uh, principles or different uh, components that they will use in terms of evaluating and guiding in the development of the guidelines. Comes from the work of Bill Cope and Merrick Kalansi in 2015. They have adapted it based on a much larger group that was brought together. Uh, and they've been working on this for the last eight months. And we will eventually send it out to the community to get feedback. Uh, we are hoping to have this released at this year's general conference in 2019 as just an example or as a sample of what the 2021 formal UNESCO guidelines are going to look like. So in summary, the first point I want to make is that we have a broken system, education system. We need to rectify that. And we need to rectify that with a system which is dynamic, in immersive, interactive, a multimodal uh, method. The other is provide the pedagogical element learning assessment, not only for intellectual but emotional intelligence. I really make a strong point that it has to have. And there's been a push for pro-social behavior uh, competencies, all for the wrong reason, but still it's, it's better than nothing. The reason that they are pushing for social emotional learning is to increase the productivity of us as workers. Uh, so I think that's the wrong objective, but I think in the process, the human being and the social, the perspective of the being will emerge. And then UNESCO's approach is the WISAC declaration, and this is where I think the community as a whole should be engaged, and I'm hoping for Games for Change to be one of the major partners as we move towards the 2021 UNESCO guidelines. By the way, <laughs> just if you're interested, the money. I find this as the positive externality, if those who have worked in economics, it not, should not be the objective, but by the way, there's a business model here, and it's a big one. So the call to action, I'm, as I've emphasized again and again, is these guidelines are important, and if they do get approved, and we'll make sure it does get approved, it gets endorsed by 193 countries who are member states of UNESCO. So you basically get a major input into all those countries. That's an open pathway. I think I have to revise that to 192 because the US is no longer a member of UNESCO. Uh, I expected a little bit more laughter. <laughs> well, I had a few, so I shouldn't be too greedy. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to have a sign-up form on our Framer space. This is a platform that we developed at, UNE at uh, MGIP. It took about three years to develop this platform. It's a modular platform where people can come and build curriculums. They can put their games in, build curriculums around that game. It's, open. it's an open source uh, platform. It's, it's got an AI uh, driving underneath to, to sort of look at patterns, primarily focus on sentiment and emotional analysis of uh, the reactions uh, from kids who, who work on the platform. And we've just managed to sign with the Indian government to get about uh, 10,000 students on that platform. So hopefully the AI will start getting trained. But that's going to be relatively biased data because it's all from India. So we would like to get from other parts of the world. We've just signed with Kyrgyzstan. Kyrgyzstan to have all your schools on this platform. So uh, have a look at that. We have set up something for the guidelines where you could make your comments. Uh, and when we have our first set of industrial set guidelines, you can make those comments on how to improve those and stuff. So I like to put the 
title at the end rather than the beginning. So let's not kill the golden goose. Games are great. Digital learning is great. Let's do it in a strategic manner so that it gets mainstreamed into schooling systems. That's me. I hope to see you in WISAC, uh, which is our yearly conference. Some of you here have already been to the previous ones. It's a great place to meet. It's a great place to also have capacity training so we can have, give you reach to India. If you want body counts, we can provide body counts. Uh, we have a billion and two people. Uh, so we get a lot of teachers who are eager to learn digital and especially games. Um, and this is a great place to also network with other uh, people of the same mindset. We also bring in people who are skeptical as well, just to challenge them. We have something called a disruptors panel, right, to start off the conference where we get people to really disrupt and not, react, not agree with each other. So it's December 10 to 12, and the best thing is it's by one of the best beaches. <laughs> it's a beach town resort. So see you in WISAC, December 10 to 12, and that's the website to get in touch with us. Thank you very much.